Play it with Xbox Game Pass. So welcome everyone. So for the panel today, it's kind of rather hazily called a year on the seas, but we're actually going to discuss the EU around Sea of Thieves and also tall tales, why we made them, how we make them as well. Um, and in terms of the EU, we can either talk about the extended universe for Sea of Thieves or we can talk about Brexit. So <laughs> Brexit. Brexit, okay. So the backstop then. <laughs> I think Brexit needs new and interesting ways right now, actually. <laughs> that would really come in handy. So, without further ado, we shall start. So, now as some of you will know, hopefully, Sea of Thieves has this rich, expanded universe that sits around it. This has been there since before launch, so some of these things we, we launched. Um, I think the first one, Tales from the Sea of Thieves, came out at launch. Then obviously we've had a comic series, we've had the novel Athena's Fortune. And just about now, is it out yet, Pete? You can confirm? Yeah, it's, it's out this month, actually. So the role-playing game yeah. is out this month. Yes. Now, the in <laughs> so the interesting thing with the role-playing game is it's probably got more lore in there than the other three things put together. So even if you don't like playing games, it is well worth buying if you're interested in the lore of Sea of Thieves. And yeah, has some really cool dice as well, and a map of the Sea of Thieves It does well. have a full-sized map yeah. of the Sea of it's Thieves. very cool, yeah. Yeah, all the secrets. Mm. <laughs> Um, so Pete's going to very quickly talk you through, particularly the comics to start with. So we're just going to have a quick chat about how we go about making the comics, how they come about, and then what they mean for the broader um, Sea of Thieves universe. Yeah, so, hence. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, um, so obviously with, we started with the Tales book, um, and as part of our process, all the partners that we work with, what we'll do is we'll kind of get them into the studio, um, we'll brief them through kind of like the guardrails that are to the world, because obviously we have this kind of pre-established pre kind of idea of what the, the universe is like, basically. So when you're working with new partners, you kind of have to kind of brief them in, you have to kind of set them like the, the, the kind of rules of the world, and then ultimately we then kind of give them creative freedom to kind of go off and come up with like new and interesting characters. So, um, so it's, a, it's, it's a really, it's, it's a very creative process and there's a lot of kind of to and fro between us at the studio who have developed the game, who've created the characters in the world, and then people who are new to this and kind of working with us and kind of branching out even further. And so a lot of this will start with, at least initially, you'll have a, a script to begin with. Um, uh, in this case, the comics have been written by uh, Jeremy Whiteley, who I was just talking to over there. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's a really creative chap. He actually, um, was the guy who came up with uh, Lissetti and DeMarco. Um, so in this case, we had a script come through from Jeremy Whiteley. We had a read through it. We kind of like, you know, we, had, we kind of collaborated on a bit. Uh, and once we were happy with that, it then got passed on to a team of artists. Uh, one of the guys, uh, Rob Marsalius, who does the artwork for the books, very talented chap. He'll then do blue lines of the artwork. We'll have a look at that. And then there'll just be this back and forth until we kind of get to a place where we're really happy with where the comics are. Um, and what's been quite interesting about this as well is obviously, it's, it's kind of expanded the universe in a way that is kind of unexpected to us, um, but really, really, really quite cool because it gives us these new characters, these new really strong characters, really, really strong archetypes and stuff that we then kind of canonized, because all the work that we do is canonical, we then canonized them and then brought them back into the game. And obviously, you know, as players of Sea of Thieves, you'll have seen Lissetti and DeMarco, the, the leaders of the Sea Dogs, um, in the game. And obviously they originate from the comics. So um, all the work that we do with the Tales book, with the comics, with the novel, it's all canonical. So we're creating this kind of larger world that becomes much more than the game. So for everybody who's playing the game, everybody who's even in the comics, it's, it's just this, it's just the universe, basically. So. It's really exciting for us to work on that. Um, I think it's very important as well that if you don't read the comics and you don't read the books, it doesn't impact your enjoyment of the game. But equally, if you just come to the comics or the books not knowing the game, you should just have as much kind of, you know, get as much out of it as you would anything else. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is that just the level of collaboration we have, and Mike can attest to this, we have this horrendous timeline, which is every every event that's happened in and out of the game and we're trying to make sure that everything like fits together. And it sometimes takes a bit of massaging, doesn't it, Mike? I'm not going to say it's live. So, but... so we, have, we, we, we literally have a, a timeline that kind of begins roughly when Ramsey first yeah. encountered or, or found his way through to the Sea of Thieves to what would be now the modern yeah. day. All the way up to, I guess, if you think about where we are now in Sea of Thieves, that's current time, that's the present day. 
like where we're going next. That's kind of in the end of that kind of timeline, and we'll keep extending that as we as we add content. But I think the, as you said there, the process is quite it's quite organic, isn't it? Mm. Like we had the whole plan to introduce Marco and Lacedi, introduce with the comic books, and then when we were working on the arena, we wanted to create a set of characters that were that classic pirate. They were the rock stars of the Sea of Thieves world, and I think it became clear quite quickly that we don't need to create new characters. We've already got uh, canonical characters with DeMarco and Lacedi. Let's move the timeline on. Let's go. They're, they're not the characters that you met in the comic books. Time has passed. Something has happened to them. That's on the timeline. And then they founded this trading company in the Sea Dogs. And for people that find Sea of Three through the comics, it's going to be stronger. Or for people who play the game then read the comics, you've got this kind of... It's like figure skating. We're kind of going over the same ground again and again with, from different viewpoints. So it all, it's all just strengthened by it. It's just a different window into the same world. So we won't dwell on the next thing. This is the first little exclusive of the panel. So this is how we make a cover. So this is some new artwork, which we'll reveal more about later. Uh, but this kind of just shows you the process we go through. So um, at Rare, we get the like the very roughs over there on the left, and then we kind of, it gets worked up, we approve it, and then there's a kind of final, and you can see the beautiful kind of cover art there. Um, by, by Yolanda Zanfardino, very talented artist. Very talented artist mm -hmm. indeed, but we'll talk more about what that relates to in a moment. So, as we've just said, obviously there's the EU, exists outside, and these people have shifted in, so Lacedi and DeMarco are a great example of characters that we took from the comics and have brought back, but obviously it works the other way too. Um, so we have kind of characters who sit within the world, who then move out into the extended universe and vice versa. Good old Stitcher Jim there. Watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> but then Pete, would you like to talk about this? Yeah, um, so, so obviously, you know, we, we, we have a lot of these characters that we've kind of developed, we've really kind of gone to town and kind of developed in the comics. You know, it's uh, Lissetti and DeMarco especially, you know, in the um, first volume of comics we created really kind of went to town and kind of developed them and their crew and all this type of thing. And they had their, you know, these kind of uh, ructions between each other. And then ultimately they came together at the end. Um, but one thing we haven't done in the comics to date yet is actually dive deeper into some of the characters that are core to the player's experience. So like Madame Olivia and like Humphrey um, and uh, Molly. So these are these are characters that you're kind of all familiar with. You've kind of interacted them, with them a lot. They've kind of been involved in tall tales mm -hmm. here and there, but we've never actually kind of dived into what their, you know, their origins are. So... Um, and with that, <laughs> perfect segue, we can announce... <laughs> The Sea of Thieves origin series. So this is a comic book series which is detailing each, the formation of each of the main trading companies. And you, literally you in this room, are the only people in the world who are going to get a physical copy of this because it's not... Are you ready? Are you ready? There he is in all its form. <laughs> Good, and so, and so this is, and so this is volume one, and so um, it's it's kind of divided into three parts, and it really it really tracks the journeys of each of those characters, and like Ramsey, their journey to the Sea of Thieves, you know, sometime after Ramsey first discovered it, but it's going to really focus on each of those characters, and um, yeah, there's 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 some. Uh, I won't spoil it too much because I want because I want you I want you to read the comic, <laughs> but um, it's there's some some beautifully crafted stories there and some lovely artwork as well. So. And for those people not in the room, these will be released at some point in the future. They will. Yes. Um, but yes, we'll announce that at a later date. Yes. So obviously you can all scan it and put it on Reddit and ruin it for everyone, <laughs> <laughs> or you can keep it secret, keep it hidden away in a chest somewhere, to be enjoyed only by yourself. So obviously when we came to do Tall Tales, and this is where we're going to hand over to Mike, we took Athena's fortune, and we saw that really as kind of the prequel to Shores of Gold. Um, so, you know, if you've read the book, it just adds all of this kind of backstory to what happens within the Tall Tales. If you haven't read the book again, it doesn't matter, you know, it still exists on its own right. Um, but Mike's going to talk us through some Tall Tales now. Cool. Got my makeshift. There we go. Phase of <laughs> <laughs> cool. So I think uh, everything the guys just said with the, the EU or the expanded universe, we've always kind of had that desire to not only explore these things outside of the game with the comic book, with a novel, with a tales book. 
There's always been that desire to bring the EU into the game, to make it relevant for everybody who plays the game. I mean, it, even if you discover the game through the comics, if you then play the game, we want it to all kind of reference each other. But with Tall Tales, there's, um, I guess, much more of a grander vision for why we wanted to bring it into the game. And if you think about the game that we launched, based around that core vision of players creating stories together, there was law, but if you think about how that was delivered, it was very much just through NPC dialogue. It was around just taking in the world as you explore it. The opportunity that we saw was, how can we make you feel the emotions that you feel when you have these emergent adventures, but on demand? We can make you care about certain characters, feel that sense of adventure, feel that sense of mystery, but have it any time that you want it with these stories. And we're very confident that the Sea of Thieves world was big enough and rich enough to be able to support it. And with that as well, I mean, it, it's quite a, quite a challenging concept in terms of how you tell a narrative in what is effectively a multiplayer sandbox. And I think what we realised very quickly was the opportunity that we had here. And if you think, just think about the, the games industry as it stands today, I mean, it, to, to make a kind of crude assessment, it's, it is kind of split between two camps. You've got players that want that traditional cinematic roller coaster ride where they feel the emotions that they feel when they watch a movie and they want to have that when they want it there's that and then there's multiplayer games where it's mechanics on the surface having that moment to moment experience and you've got enough reason to replay it and you're having that experience how do we how do we merge them together and we believe that there was there's no reason why you can't feel the emotions that you feel in a traditional single player game but have it in a multiplayer world and by doing that, it's going to make the world feel all the more richer because of it. It's going to feel more impactful that you're doing these cinematic stories in a world where anything can happen and it's unpredictable. You could be solving an epic love story, but you're doing it in a storm, you're fighting a kraken, you're fighting a megalodon. And we, we saw like a huge opportunity there to kind of bring these two worlds together. And there's no reason why you can't tell multiple stories. You, you don't have to have a bloated narrative. You could tell a tight three-hour narrative, you could tell a 15-hour narrative, you can tell these stories within this multiplayer world. And even if you play it and you never play it again, that's fine. Because we've got an opportunity to explain why that shipwreck's there, why that island is called the way it is, why those characters are in the world and what their motivations are. So if you never do the stories again, the world is richer, it's easier to role play, it's easier to get immersed. I mean, that was the opportunity that we saw. Before we ever got into what was that first story going to be, in our minds, just thinking about the quests in Sea of Thieves and how they stood at that time, we had a bunch of kind of mechanics that we wanted to bring into the game, even before we thought about story. And if you think about the quest books, the quest books were an opportunity to have these richer and deeper kind of puzzling mechanics. And you could have, think of that riddle gameplay that we had at launch. This was kind of going one step further and the opportunity to play with kind of maps and different riddles and different kinds of puzzles, but make sure they thematically made sense for the story. And the book itself is, it's a, it's a symbol of tall tales. It was a book very deliberately because it felt like a tale and a story that you're opting into. On one tale, it could be a ship's log. On another tale, it could be a lover's diary. And another tale, it could be a book of the dead. So straight away, the book was a symbol of what was unique about that tale. And this is something that, it makes so much sense in the Sea of Thieves world, but kind of puzzle vaults, solving puzzles on Ireland. It's got that classic Goonies and Indiana Jones feel. That, that feel we always believed worked so well in Sea of Thieves. We really wanted to bring that into Tall Tales. Same as the traps. I mean, it's just perfect. Again, that Goonies kind of connotation of the booby traps and navigating these pirate caves, overcoming challenges. We really believe that that was going to sit so well in Tall Tales. And one thing you'll start seeing over the next couple of months is these traps spreading to the other islands. We always saw the potential in investing in these mechanics for Tall Tales, but then all of them enriching the whole game. So showing up in voyages, the voyages over time becoming richer because we have these mechanics, the island becoming more interesting to navigate. And this was a big push for us, which was enchanted items. So taking the tools that the players had, like the spyglass and the compass and the lantern, and bringing in new gameplay around them and having it make sense as part of the story. So when you're on a tall tile, it just feels so different to the standard voyages that you're doing. That looks a bit like a Kraken, Mike. It does indeed. It's, uh, it's old mother. New and interesting ways. There you go. Um, 
That's and, one, one of my favorite pictures here. Yeah, so this gray marrow. So not, not only bringing in boss characters, but also in a story explaining where, what kind of, what the hierarchy of the skeletons are and where these characters have come from. And this was, this was right there from the start. This, we, we called this the collector's chest. And this was the idea of, rather than just delivering quest objects in a, in a kind of obvious way, actually deliver them in a treasure chest. And the tools not rules approach that is so important to our design philosophy, rather than just having the chest and opening it and having that awesome pirate moment, you get to keep the chest and then you get to use it as a container. So we got a lot of feedback on, on Reddit, on our official forums around, I'd love a wheelbarrow in Sea of Thieves to carry all my quest job objects in. And this, this is like the perfect answer to it. It's a tool that you can use. And right now, you find them in the game and they're empty. You're shortly going to see them washing up with objects inside, with gold inside. All of the riddle rewards for the riddle voyages will be replaced with these collector's chests. So you'll be, we'll be pumping a lot more rewards into the riddles and it'll just feel just feel a little bit richer because of these. So that, that will be rolling out quite shortly. Literally richer. Yeah, literally richer. Mm. And then we had those mechanical ideas and the next step was what's the right story to tell? And there's so many stories you could tell in the Sea of Thieves world. And I guess the way we talked on the team was Shores of Gold is the closest parallel we're ever going to get in terms of a main campaign for Sea of Thieves. And we were thinking about what, what could that story be? And very quickly we landed on the opportunity to bring in the gold hoarder and also explain the pirate lord. I and mean, we, we always talk about the pirate lord. We'd done little figures of him in the past. But to the average player, the only exposure you get to the pirate lord is if you play whatever it is now, 600 hours to get to the pirate hideout and you go down there and you meet him and it's the first time. Bring him in the story right at the start. So you start hearing about him and you see him in, in the tales. But the gold hoarder is the, he's the opposite to the pirate lord. He's, the, he's the, the pirate that gave into greed. He's the antithesis of that crew loyalty and that crew bond. So telling that duality between the pirate lord and the gold hoarder made absolute sense. And what we wanted was this driving force behind, behind the story. We wanted the player to interact with all these different characters, have all these kind of different emotions on demand. But we wanted this very clear driving force right from the start. And we chose the idea of, again, that adventure trope of a lost island. This lost island in the mist that if you, if you knew the way to get there, you could chart a course and discover what mysteries it's hold. And that, this, the shores of gold itself, the idea of reaching it, that's the whole driver behind the story and the whole idea of the shroud break of this object that can get you there. That, that was kind of the backbone of the story. So no matter how you interacted with the characters and you had the love story, you had the tale of revenge, that was the driving force. So it's all about the shores of gold. And I guess the best way to wrap up what I've just said is, is hopefully, hopefully see the trailer <laughs> that you've probably seen. But it's very Work. Cool. There we go. Yes. <laughs> there is an island that lies beyond the borders of this world. Impossible to reach without great power. The Shroudbreaker is that power. And there are many on these seas who seek it. But this adventure belongs to you. Follow the clues left by those who came before, and the rewards within your grasp are riches unimaginable. If you can face those who guard them. Well, what are you waiting for? The skull of a skeleton lord. Impressive. But you must take care, for great danger lies ahead. Honestly, that trailer was just 
irreplaceable on the team. When we first got the, the cut of that first trailer, we would go down into one of the meeting rooms, we'd turn the lights off, all the designers that were working on Tall Tales, in the thick of making this thing, of trying to solve problems, trying to get it in a state where we could release it, just needing that little bit of a little boy in air confidence, a little bit of excitement, and we'd go down, we'd watch that video and think, we're almost there. Like we're almost we're to ship something that we really believe in. So I think uh, as, I think as, I think as well from that kind of expanded universe kind of perspective as well, kind of actually having goals where I realised them in the flesh, a character who kind of existed within the studio and we kind of developed and all, all that type of thing, and even had him appearing as a statue at certain events and stuff. You know, actually seeing him in the flesh, as it were, in the game, it was just it was just a fantastic moment, wasn't it? It was, it really was. And where we. In terms of developing the Tall Towers, once we had that story, uh, we knew we wanted to tell this love story in the Sea of Thieves world. And I think, I don't know whether it's because we're sadists or we like to do really hard <laughs> things, but rather than go after the obvious stuff, which we're always going to do, like the Indiana Jones, go after the lost artifact, navigate some deadly temples and all of that, of course we're going to do that, that's obvious. But what was the thing that was a little bit less obvious, which was the first tower we're ever going to build, we're going to build a love story. And that's where we started. And let's challenge ourselves in how we use the quest book, in how we try and get to that emotion with the writing, with what you're physically doing in game, to try and capture some of that emotion. And before we, I guess, really kind of started work, we realised that, that ambitious vision that we had um, for the Shores of Gold story and just where we wanted to take Tall Tales, we realised that we, like, the design team wasn't big enough. And we actually, we've actually got more designers working on Sea of Thieves now than before launch. And we hired some incredible people like George Orton's here today. He's, his first panel done exceptional work on the Shores of Gold story and the tales that he built. And we had Steve Dillon, Neil Atkinson, um, who else am I forgetting? Connell. Connell, Connell Blake. Did absolutely amazing work on the tall tales. Um, so we've got to grow the design team to actually build skills in actually telling narrative in the Sea of Thieves world. And we've, we've kind of cut our teeth on that first Shores of Gold story and we're going we're gonna to keep going and keep telling stories in this world. But where we started with this before we really got to the detailed design was where we always start, which is really just a really simple statement. So this is the origin of Wild Rose. Simple as that. Players travel in the footsteps of a love story between two pirates who form their bond after overcoming incredible dangers together. Players go in search of one of the missing lovers, but there's a tragic ending. And that was kind of, that's the pitch to the team, this is what we're gonna go build. And then, what the hell are we gonna do? <laughs> and so I'll, for that, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to George, and George's gonna explain about the process of how we created Wild Rose. Thanks, Mike. Uh, can you all hear me all right, yeah? So Mike gave me that pitch on my first day at Rare and even like I've heard it a few times since then and even hearing it now like the excitement that I feel around Tall Tales and obviously what we've now done with it is huge but where I know we're going um, it's just a really exciting kind of platform to build on. Um, that being said going for a love story first was a bit of a challenge. Um, so we had to kind of figure out where we wanted to go quite quickly um, and then figure out how we were going to build nine more of these these tales um, in, a, like, in a way that was sustainable for the team but also meant that each of them would hit the same quality bar and we'd be super stoked with all of them. So to do that, we, um, we started outside <laughs> of the game um, and we built the tales in the quickest, dirtiest way we could possible. Um, what better way to prototype quest books than with actual paper? So we started writing the stories. We had the two lovers. Uh, before they were called Rose and George, they were called Huey and Drewy. Um, not after the ducks, but actually after Hugh Grant and Drew Barrymore in the absolute classic film, Music and Lyrics. Um, and those, those were the dev names because we needed these characters and we needed to establish who they were. Um, and then we used those characters to spurn the stories that they would go on, the relationship they would have, um, because we knew we wanted the puzzles in the quest book to be part of the story rather than feeling like puzzles. And it took us a little while to get those things right. Um, we had to, that's why there are three versions of the prototype there. Um, there are actually about 15 different versions of that, but I picked the ones with the best covers. Um, 
it took us ages to get these right and we would run regular prototypes in the studio and we'd get fresh faces and people who played two or three of them up and we would basically sit them in front of the game. We hadn't built a tall tale in the game at all yet. We'd just sit them in front of the game, give them this quest book, give them the short introduction speech um, to the tale, which I believe during the very early ones, it wasn't Madame Olive, it was some... Uh, we were... So this was before Forsaken Shores had come out and the sea posts weren't in the game yet, but we knew they were coming. Um, and the tale of love was going to very romantically start at one of these sea posts with a guy who'd found an old book and just wanted you to take it off him, which we quickly realised was not the emotion we were going for. So we tied Madame Olive into the story and gave her a relationship with the characters. Um, but we learned that through these prototypes because players were going, oh, I don't really know why I'm here, I don't really know why I'm chasing these lovers. So we quickly established like a lot of lessons that we would then use throughout the other tales of tying in the introductions and the outros and stuff to make this one continued narrative. Um, the orange box up there is the first ever collector's chest in Sea of Thieves. <laughs> the first time a treasure chest opened. The two, uh, the pink and blue post-it notes are in fact the rewards that players would get for finding, for solving the puzzles in the quest book. Um, it was all way more exciting than it looks in that photo. <laughs> and I'm about to show you a short clip of the very first playtest we ever did of The Tale of Love. Um, so this was shortly after we'd done the speech as the old Sea Post guy who was like, please just take my book. Um, and players didn't really know what was happening. But they quickly read through the quest book. They established who the lovers were. Um, they went and found the collector's chest, opened it, and received the first two or three at that time puzzles. Um, and they began solving them. And it was this magic moment that I'm about to show you. The rest of the playtest went horrifically wrong. <laughs> it, were, it took them about three hours to, tr to solve the first set of puzzles. And we wanted these tales to be an hour long. Um, they had no idea what they were doing. But that's why we were prototyping in paper, was to try and figure these things out quickly and make these mistakes so that when we were building all nine of these together, they would come up at the same way and we would learn the lessons at the start of the project rather than halfway through or at the end. And then despite the kind of the struggles of that first playtest, we knew we were onto something with the quest books and with the, like, the storytelling puzzles and the players solving these puzzles through story rather than feeling like they were in an escape room or something like that. We were knew we were onto something when two of our players read the vows puzzle. I don't know if any of you have played Wiles Rose, but the two lovers were meant to get married, and I won't spoil it for anyone that hasn't played it, but they were meant to get married, so we came up with this puzzle that would try to engage more members, as many members of the crew as possible and kind of lean into that Sea of Thieves thing as players playing together and figuring things out together. And we had this magic moment where we knew we'd cracked it, basically. <laughs> from Smuggler's Day, we stand. Okay, from so where? Where we stand. Where? Okay, uh, now? Thieves. Two. And? Where? I think that's where? it. Where? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I I so I go from, you go Smuggler. From, okay, Smuggler's? Bay. Where? We. Now. Stand. Two. Thieves. Heaven. And? Beyond. Wheel. Remain. In. Love. Through. Storm. And? Skellies. On. Thieves. Plundered. Seize. Always. Yours. With. Treasure. And. Grog. Until. Where. Grey. And. Old. Wheel. Keep. In. Good. Health. In. Shipwreck. And. Wealth. Till. The. Ferryman. No. Longer. Bears. Our. Souls. <laughs> oh my god. This is so adorable. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. That was the exact reaction we were hoping for. So with that moment, um, we took that away from the rest of the, the playtest and we'd learned everything else. And we went back and we basically went through all of the puzzles that we had up to that point um, and realised that most of them were too puzzly. They, they felt like crosswords in the back of a newspaper or something, apart from that one. And as a design team, we sat down um, over several meetings it was. it was. It was a long process to go, how can we recapture that magic in as much of the quest book as possible? And that's where we started littering in the referring back to previous pages, the 
actually using the earlier diary pages as part of the puzzle. So it didn't feel like like the player at no point would go, oh, we're here to solve a puzzle. It was, oh, we actually are retracing the footsteps of Rose and George. We are figuring out how they lived their life in order to try and find out where they went. So we went back through all the puzzles and littered in more moments that felt kind of human and because that's the relationship we were going for it wasn't a I know we used rom-coms in the paper prototypes but we weren't going for a rom-com kind of relationship with Rose and George we were going for a very real relationship which is why the we kind of used the music box and the spice box as the reward items rather than the earlier prototypes where we had kind of treasure we felt a music box and a spice box that they only write about once in the diary kind of makes the whole relationship feel more human so that's after the first play test we went and kind of littered those throughout and then once we'd established kind of the 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 atmosphere of the quest book and how we wanted to tell the story um we began a similar process but in line with the artists that we've got in the studio now we have some amazing artists in the studio um, and they did a phenomenal job of turning our really rough kind of screenshots and pr like paper prototypes into these beautiful works of art um, and that was a process that we kind of figured out making this tale and then applied to the other tales because they too had to figure out how to work with us because we would constantly be going back and changing puzzles and remaking puzzles and they were trying to establish an art style at the same time and make their stuff look good and we as designers were trying to make sure all the crucial information was there. So they would constantly be throwing pages like this at us where it was, please, like we'd sit down and talk about what art style we needed for each of the quest books and what how we would portray key information in the kind of very picture dense quest books or key information on pages that we wanted to be hidden but also players to find naturally so that's part of what this process was so this next clip is going to show you another thing that we wanted to build into tall tales so there were key moments that mike has mentioned like the mechanics the quest book um, we also wanted to add story in and we got that through the characters at the start and end of the Tall Tales and in their cutscenes. But the one thing that was missing from Sea of Thieves before we made Tall Tales was the, the enemies feeling like they had a proper place in the world and they kind of existed to do more than just stop you getting your quest goals and stop you like, getting the treasure, basically. And we knew that part of that was giving skeletons a voice. Um, so to do that, we had to figure out kind of how they would sit in the world, where they would belong. Um, and we, we went through a ton of prototypes. So the very, the very early days, we, would, um, we were discussing having them respond to the players' non-verbal chat um, to try and make them feel alive. But that felt really clunky and really um, kind of, it felt very video game. Um, where we then decided to just put them in the world and give them these dioramas and we would give them these dioramas um, and kind of, as part of the Tall Tales, players would stumble on skeletons that had a voice. Finally, I have you to myself. You could be a little nicer to me, given everything I've sacrificed. Time, money, skin. Grey Marrow doesn't give away his secrets. So yeah, we went through um, kind of a lot of different thoughts with that. We wondered about making the skeletons invincible while we're in these cutscenes, but that didn't feel very Sea of Thieves. So we, that's why we made them interruptible um, and gave them the combat dialogue where they'd shout at you basically when you were fighting them. And so the final thing, well, part of the um, final thing that we wanted to show was the ending cutscenes to give these tales, to make sure we were signing off the tales with the right emotion that we were shooting for. And this was a particularly challenging thing to get right for Tale of Love, given that it's an emotion that's hard to get right in visual media anyway. Like a lot of films struggle with it um, and games in particular struggle with getting that right. 
Um, so we knew we had to nail the last cut scene. Um, and we have a lot of creative people around the studio. So we decided to lean on their expressiveness. And in for the final cut scene of Rose and George's Tale, we decided to get the help of Jess Hyder, who's another designer at Rare, um, and kind of capture how she expressed some of the emotion of the tale and turn that into the final cutscene. So I'm going to show you that now. So we borrowed Jess from the project she was working on at the time um, and captured all her motions. So everything you see Madame Olive do in Tale of Love, well, Wild, Wild Rose, um, is Jess. Um, we captured her and the, the animators worked really hard to kind of match her movements because she was so good at expressing kind of Olive's trepidation but also hope that she could help her friends. This bit is really spoiler if you haven't played the tale. <laughs> <laughs> so Rose and George there um, were also captured in the same way that we captured Jess, but that's actually um, two of the other designers on the team, Shelley and Andy Preston. Um, we captured them kind of sharing a moment together and they knew we were capturing it. It wasn't, it wasn't like a weird thing. Um, <laughs> and we decided to put that in the game um, and the clip of that, them actually hugging. Um, Andy was very, very strict with me saying I couldn't show that here. But it, it, it is available if you know where to look on the internet. <laughs> that sounds even worse. <laughs> Tale of Love, yeah. <laughs> so that was a really quick run through of how we made Tale of Love um, and that was the first tall tale we ever made. So a lot of those lessons were kind of transposed into how we made the other tales. Um, and depending on the mechanics that were there and the emotions we wanted to go through, um, we would alter them slightly. But that was how we made all of the tall tales, basically. Um, and we have learned a lot from making those nine. We're very proud of what we made in those nine. Um, but I think there's more to come. And we may be applying Ooh. some of those lessons in the future. To not tell you anything about those <laughs> is Mike. Cool. Thank you, George. Nice one. So, if anyone's played the game recently, you've, you've probably seen us do lots of little environmental storytelling and clues in the world. Like we're trying to tell this story or seed this story we're going to tell through our monthly engagement events. So we've been placing clues around the world. If anyone's been to Shipwreck Bay recently, you'll see that there's been some changes at the shipwreck, um, particularly in the interior cabin. So again, as I said with Tall Tales, the, the potential was always using stories to explain why the world is the way it is. And this island, Shipwreck Bay, has been there since right since our early alphas and betas, a, a, an island everyone knows, and knows, knows well. Um, and if you go into the cabin, there's been a painting there and it's you know, the ship, the Black Witch. So the first tale um, that we're going to be releasing is called The Seabound Soul. That's a, a new tale coming. And it's the start of a, a new narrative arc that's going to tie some of these clues together that you're starting to see in the world. Um, some interesting characters that you may have seen recently. Um, and I, I won't spoil too much of it, but all of these elements are are linked in, a, in, in quite an interesting way. And that tale is going to start and propel that arc, uh, hopefully to some interesting conclusions, um, particularly around a particular captain, um, passionate, fiery captain um, <laughs> that you may have heard about. Um, what, what, what we didn't want to do is, again, try and do anything too obvious, try and take the story in, a, in an unexpected direction. Um, so 
through this next set of tales, you'll see this story go and hopefully it's going to be a, re a really good payoff. But the, it's, all about to, it's all about to start with events happening on, on Shipwreck Bay. So keep, keep your eyes peeled for, for the Seabound Soul releasing at uh, some point in the future. Very soon, hopefully. Should we go to some questions? I'm going to stand back up now. Um, as a bonus point, I, I'm going to do a little quiz. This is unprompted, wasn't it? So Stitcher Jim, the voice artist, does anyone know who he played in Game of Thrones? Ooh. No one's winning the prize then. And we're not going to tell <laughs> you either then. Judgmental tap on uh -huh. the finger so there. We'll keep that one then. Um, go on, reveal. Who is it, Pete? I'm not sure. The character. Well, this is dreadful if you don't know the answer. <laughs> so, so I don't know the answer. Well, there you go. So there's a mystery for you there to find out. Um, but before we do take questions then, I was going to say Jay, who is here from the Crow's Nest, who some of you may know, is a great member of our community. It's his birthday today. So stand up, Jay, so we can thoroughly embarrass you. There you go. So yeah, so if anyone questions, as long as it's not which Game of Thrones character, it'd be good to, uh, be good to uh, yes, go for it. Yeah. So my question is just like, you know, with you guys expanding out and doing the other stuff like the books and, you know, also having the new story arcs are coming to Sea of Thieves itself, um, did you realize when you guys were starting with the game so long ago before the actual release that it was going to turn into this thing that was going to be like a multimedia outlet where it would turn into books and other franchises and then you're going to release a physical game? Like, was that a long-term goal for you guys or was this just one of those things that as it became more popular, you kind of started spreading out from there? It's probably a two-part. I mean, yeah, I'd say from the off, we probably treated it, and then you can obviously join, like chip in, but we treated it like a franchise from day one. So even before we released. So things like the Tales book, they were all written and it was all ready to go way before the game came out. Yeah, yeah. and the stuff in the Tales mm -hmm. book that hasn't yet played out in the game yet. So the stuff that's from pre-release that hasn't actually played out in the game itself. So yeah, so we always intended for this to be a big franchise um, and to have this big expanded universe and all the lore. So yeah, it was always the plan. So we're kind of kind of inspired by you know there's there's a lot of other big established IPs out there you know at one set in space that you might have heard of and stuff that have these huge kind of expanded universes and so we're kind of quite inspired by that and we we want, we want to do the same thing from a very early stage with Sea of Thieves and um, create this kind of like vast body of lore. Um, and I, I recall the meeting we had with Mike where we decided that everything was canon uh -huh, as well. Yep, and uh -huh, that was quite a yep. big deal it was, because it was. like committing to that and making sure it all fitted together certainly wasn't something we took lightly because we, we knew how much we had planned and there's a lot more coming as well outside of the game. There's all the stuff that's coming in the game, there's loads more coming outside the game. So yeah, making sure we keep that in a in a fashion that all knits together. We don't those. make it easy for ourselves, do we? No, we don't. No. 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 I think it would have been so easy to just go, that's a separate world over here, and you can just say, oh, it's a, it's a big world, all these stories can go and happen, and they're parallel to what happens in the game. But I think, I think we're all big believers in, if you are a fan of the game, you want it to be authentic, credible. You want the stories to be as impactful outside of the game as they can be in the game. So once Sea of Thieves became from that prototype days, right? So it, be it became Sea of Thieves, it became the game it is. It's very much like Adam says, it became, we knew this is a, it's a pirate world and it can support all these stories, it can support these characters and like, it's been good to see it be popular. Yeah, we never wanted to have been in a position where we had all these different stories that were happening in the books and the comics and stuff, then kind of like contradicting each other as well. And so, you know, it was a very conscious decision early on when we when we first created this timeline as well, that everything kind of slotted into kind of place. And obviously as time goes by, you know, that becomes more complex and it's branching out and stuff, especially with some of the, the kind of uh, new additions of uh, Tall Tales that have uh, come to the game as well. So, but um, yeah, it's been really cool, hasn't yeah. it? I mean, the more you play in the future, look back, to the Tales book that was released was it right around launch? The first Just time? before mm -hmm. launch, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, hopefully in the future you'll go and read that and you'll see some of the stuff in there is like foreshadowing what was yeah. coming. Go, oh my God. <gasps> Master storytellers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go for you just because I can see you easily. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so you're going back in time, doing a lot of origins and lores and stuff like that. Uh, will you be doing the same thing, going forward in time with the same characters, kind of going in the direction of what's going on with them and stuff like that? That's, an interesting That's, a, great, that's a really interesting question. Mike. <laughs> oh, I... <laughs> Put I you was, on the spot. I would, I would actually, I, I think, I mean, you could do something really interesting. I think generally we'd probably steer away from that because, I, th I, I don't know, I think, I think it's, it's fun to lay the groundwork in these kind of EU materials, but to, like, to go too far in the future, I think it kind of spoils that, the element of surprise. I think you, the, game, the game should kind of lead, I think, when it comes to like pushing the timeline forward. But we can kind of let, let the world breathe a little bit in the expanded universe and explain the reason why things the way they are. I mean, it's an interesting idea, we've, but we've, I don't think we've ever discussed that. We've, we've, always, we've always had the notion that the, the, what the players are playing at this moment is now, basically. So this is, this is the present day. What the players are going through is the present day. So um, certainly with the, the story around with Lacedine de Marco and the Sea Dogs actually happened uh, a couple of years before um, players first kind of discovered the Sea of Thieves on themselves. So... Um, but it's like you say, yeah, it's like, it's like where you are in the game is kind of like now. So um, everything that we do with kind of like the expanded universe and stuff will either be now or kind of backfill this kind of question mark behind certain characters. You know, like we're doing with the original series, you know, um, you'll get a, an introspective into Madame Olivia and so on. So um, and find out just how they how they manage to get there. But I think where the players are at this moment is is now. So we'd never just like jump, jump ahead because... I don't yeah, I think Curse Cells is a good example. Mm. Like the, we're on the updates released last year that we've mm. we've kind of pulled that trick a few times now, and we will continue to do it. Where the the world kind of unfolds as you play it, and then there's just permanent changes that happen. So with that, with a character who was just a weaponsmith that became Wanda, and then you defeated her, that f felt like players players are the main characters of their lore, and they're not subservient to the characters that, the kind of secondary characters, the NPCs that we create. And I think to kind of go too far in the future, unless it was kind of really vague, it would kind of spoil some of those surprises. And yeah, we want to, want to keep the cards close to our chest, I think. So continuation will stay in game pretty much. So, say again, sorry. The continuation of the character will stay in game. Yes, forward. yes, absolutely. Indiana Jones, you keep putting your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I would. I would. I would say. I wouldn't say immediately. Like kind of soon. But I mean, there's a reason why we explored it. It's a reason why it was in the art book. Um, I think it's it's in the novels in Athena's Fortune. We kind of dive into that kind of mer folklore. I think it's a fascinating part of Sea of Thieves. The idea that there's a whole world below the waves, you know, that you haven't seen yet. Uh, would love to explore that. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's a chap here behind the pillar. I'll mm -hmm. let you point then. I can't see. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, game development is difficult, and I was wondering if you might uh, be able to, to relate some uh, a point in development that you found uh, surprisingly difficult that the players might not expect to have been that difficult, perhaps. Look at George. Yes. I'll take this. I'll take it. <laughs> All of it. No. No, <laughs> no there was... Um, so we laboured a lot of love on the quest books we were making and because they were such a big part of the stories we were making. Um, and we went into a lot of detail about kind of how they should flow and what, how each character talks and what voice we use in each of the quest books. Um, and... We, we lavished a lot of love on it, basically. And it got to very near the end of the project. And we suddenly had this realisation that we hadn't left any room for translations of those quest books in other languages to appear correctly formatted in the game. Um, and this required some very quick action. So there was one afternoon where I sat down next to this esteemed gentleman next to me and we sat at a computer and basically gutted months of work from the quest books. Um, and that was, a that was a really hard afternoon, but it was the, absolutely the right thing to do because it made sure this, the stories were there and playable for 
everyone, regardless of what language they wanted to play the game in. Um, and I'm actually kind of, that afternoon felt horrible, but I'm kind of proud that we managed to keep the story there and to keep all the emotions in all of those quest books. Um, but that was kind of, that was the toughest day of the project for me, was knowing how hard we'd worked to make, to make those books sing um, and then seeing some of it vanish. And I think we got it back. We, we did get it back and those quest books are amazing still now. But that was the toughest part for me. Did you did you go? We just need more pictures, more pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Less words, more pictures. <laughs> yeah, legendary storyteller was fine. That was fine. <laughs> Remember the tears in your eyes, George. Just had a game face. I was like, cut it, cut it. We've got to move on. We've got to ship this thing. We've got to go. Yeah, down at the front. Yep. So the Devil Shroud surrounds the Sea of Thieves. Yep. What I'm hinting at is, is there a new region coming? It's a pressing question from the community. It is a pressing You're question the from the, the community. community. So, <laughs> so t two ways to answer that. So, firstly, as part of kind of the, the kind of new stories we're going to release with the Tall Tales, you'll see certainly new. I wouldn't say new regions. I think that, that wouldn't be right, but certainly areas, new hidden areas that. Are shroud hidden from us still. Is there ways to break it other than a shroud breaker? Well, well, there's very, very astute question there. There, there may well be, and the <laughs> the idea of the devil's shroud is that it ebbs and flows. So, the whole concept of it is that narratively in our game, it makes sense that we're we're hiding things from you, and when when we're ready, we can unveil those new those cool new places. I think what we've said in the past is rather than expanding the world out, and it relates to the question at the back um, around kind of the merfolk. I think it'd be interesting to kind of explore that first, which is kind of go down rather than out. So rather than kind of expanding into another Devil's Raw type area, how could we kind of do it in a different way? And I think we are, nothing to kind of confirm, but we are kind of looking at how we could do something like that. But certainly for the new set of Tall Tales, there'll be some pretty expansive kind of new hidden areas that you'll come across. It's always been, it's always been a concept that the Devil's Raw itself is always in flux. Um, and then at some point in the past, Tribute Peak itself was actually free of the Devil's Roar, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the Shroud. Shroud. Anyway, uh, yeah. but, um, but, yeah. but it was, it was kind of like, it was free and then it was enveloped by it again. So there is this, this notion that it is constantly moving and shifting and stuff like that. So certainly it does give us a, uh, it does give us a good kind of like platform to kind of um, yeah. play with. Yeah, it works on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. On one hand, it's, it's a very organic, invisible wall. <laughs> on, a, on another level, it's kind of a narrative reason um, for us to change the world. Yeah. Um, as uh, I have to say, one of the things that I really love about the game is the sandbox nature of it. Yep. And I'm wondering, as you talk about, one of, I love Legendary Storyteller because of some of the mechanics, like arranging things from a very particular perspective in order to find mm. these other things. Oh, the wooden plank. Like the wooden plank. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as somebody, like, I enjoy kind of doing those things myself yeah. in the game. And uh, I have noticed, and I'm wondering, my question is, if this is intentional, if it's something you guys considered. Yeah. There are places, for instance, you go to a very particular fort, and you go to a very particular cannon on that fort, and you aim that very particular cannon at a very particular constellation, and a spike on the island is then pointing to another island. Yep. Um, and so it's possible to tell your own kind of stories through this kind of thing. When you guys were creating this layout, did any of that pop into your mind? Like there, yeah. In terms of the potential to tell kind of like an authored story? Not necessarily an authored story, but to create as a player your own kind of Indiana Jones adventures, your own kind of... Uh, riddles and maps, your own treasure maps that you could then lead people on, um, which is something that I enjoy doing myself uh, yeah. for people. And, and uh, so it's, it's. I just wonder because it, I, I'm amazed as I go through the world mm. to find these spots where only from this spot can yes. you see this thing. Yeah. So that that is that is absolutely deliberate, and we we called it. Um, that part, we, we actually, the creation of the islands, we, had, we used to call it the theme park approach, which was they should be kind of a feast for the eyes and ears, and they should have that element of environmental storytelling. So we call them um, like areas of interest. Yeah. So we'd have like a set quota for areas of interest on an island where we'd go in and we'd kind of tell this thematic story of 
this is where pirates may camp and that's one of them kind of in a cage there hanging and if you look at a certain time at sunset it kind of frames frames a certain view um some of that kind of came from the design team a lot of it comes from just the art team the art team is so incredibly talented and we built kind of the first 10 islands and the first island we ever built was um, Devil's Ridge and the idea was each island would have something unique about it so we wanted an island that you could climb all the way up to the peak and jump off and that would that became Devil's Ridge so it had, had these capacity to create these gameplay moments or wouldn't it be cool if we had an island where you could completely hide your ship and that became Thieves Haven. So right at the start, we kind of set the, set the benchmark for what Ireland should be. And once we had that, the art team have just run and run with it. And it's just, a, it's just kind of like automatic from their perspective now that they're not, just, they're not just these kind of empty islands. They have got this sense of history if you look for it. It was always the idea that they are, and it relates to your question around creating these stories in your head. The islands were stages. They're, they're, they're stages for play. They're stages for you to role play and immerse yourself. And every, every island needs to be approached from many different directions. And that was critical to the game design because you're going to be going to these islands a lot but with completely different context. One minute you're going there to do a bounty quest. One minute you're just exploring because you're looking for some kind of emergent treasure. Another, another time you're going there to go find chickens. I mean, you're going there for a tall tale. It needs to support all of these gameplay types. So the island process, and maybe in relating to the question around challenging game design, I think the level design of this game is particularly challenging because of how, how we've got now authored tall tale systems and we've got procedural systems that are existing voyages. The game's got to support a lot. Kudos to them because there are some beautiful. I, I write riddles and and going to these places and yeah. finding the images that I see, like looking at clouds. You know, it's, it's you see these things in the islands that are just they just cause sort of sparks of imagination. And so, kudos to the design team for for that kind of yeah. stuff because it's amazing, absolutely. Amazing. Cool. Yeah, I think. Anything that makes it easier to just escape into this world and immerse yourself and just, just get lost in that moment. I mean, that's, that's exactly what Sea of Thieves is about. So it's great, great to hear that. Good um, question. The gentleman at the back, you've had your arm up a long time. <laughs> Do you monsters or islands on the way? Ooh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just really quickly, relating to the, the gentleman at the back who shouted out about gunpowder skellies. Mm -hmm. So we did actually um, put a change in insiders, which was kind of slowing down the skeletons carrying the keg so you could be more strategic with lining up the shots. We made that change for the Athena's voyages. We didn't want to make too many changes at the same time. And like feedback has been kind of split on that. So, but we, we will look at that. Next question. So I think we've got time for one more. Yeah. Go on then. I'll let you pick, Pete. You were pointing. Uh, someone. No pressure. Chap in the red t-shirt. Uh, given these is an ongoing process. Do you have the resources to also create new titles? I think, I think as a, <laughs> I would say that as, as a, a studio like Rare, obviously with, with their heritage and like Ed, the desire to, you know, innovate and do interesting things in the industry, just as a, as, as a creative company, you've always got your eye on the future. I mean, there's absolutely nothing to confirm right now, but as a creative company, we've always got our eye on where the industry's going and what creative opportunities there could be. I think Sea of Thieves, like, it just feels like we're getting started. I mean, this game has been out 18 months and we're, you know, just by virtue of the fact of what we released with Anniversary, where there's a whole new kind of quest system in there, we want to bring some of those quest mechanics from Tall Tales into the existing voyages. There's new ways where the narrative can go in the game. There's new enemies, new world regions we can kind of look into in the future. I mean, this, this world has got so many more um, opportunities to surprise and delight our players. And in, in, the, in the words of the Pirate Lord, there's, there'll always be new stories to tell. I think that's all we've got time for. So just, uh, it's Yoren, by the way. Have I said that right? Game of Thrones? No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Someone went, oh, so <laughs> it must be. So you've all won a comic, that means. Well done, everyone. Yeah. Um, but thank you all for coming. We'll give you all the comic on your way out and we'll be outside if you want to have a chat with us. Yeah. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you.